Joshua 1 and 5, and it reads as follows from the New King James Version. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Can I read that just one more time? No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Here's the word the Lord gave to me. He said, nothing can stop us. Look at someone and say, nothing can stop us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word of revelation today. We thank you for what you're about to say to our hearts and our souls. Lord, we pray that this word would edify us, revive us, and lead us to the place that you want us to dwell and be. Lord, we thank you for our sweet sanctification of how the Holy Spirit works in us and develops us into who he has called us to be. Lord, we pray if there's one here that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then we pray that the music, the prayers, the scripture readings, the sermon will work in conjunction to bring them into relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you would just anoint my mind, my heart, my mouth, that I might be used by you today, Lord. Lord, we just want you to have your way. We want you to speak. We want souls to be saved. We want the church to be added to. We want lives to be transformed. And we thank you in advance for everything that you're going to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, let everyone say amen. 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 You may be seated, ushers, you may retire. Nothing can stop us. Nothing can stop us. Many times humanity makes the mistake of allowing our lives, our dreams, our visions, and our ambitions to be driven by perceived limitations rather than spiritual realities because perceived limitations will always speak to what I cannot do in my own might and my own strength. It will always try to be a deterrent for me stepping out and trusting God. But spiritual realities tell us that in spite of what we see, in spite of what we face, that our God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than what we could ask or receive. Uh, we tend only to aim as far as we we feel we can reach in life. We tend to make decisions about our lives and per adventures based upon what we perceive we have the capacity to do. And I don't know about you, Eden, but sometimes I just have to stop and give God a praise, a shout, and a holler uh, that the things in my life are not based upon what I can do on my own strength. But I'm glad that God has a divine tendency to step in when my human strength reaches its limitation and God does those things that I cannot do on my own. As a matter of fact, if some of us would enumerate and look back over our lives today, we would realize that we are not where we are on our journey based upon our own might, our own strength, our own intellect. But we have a sail to our lofty places in life because God stepped in and did what we could not do for ourselves. Within the confines of the context of life and destiny, we must come to the concrete reality that our reach as humanity is very limited on what we can do on our own. There are very few things that we can accomplish within the scope of our own human capacity. Furthermore, there is even fewer things that we can accomplish independent of the Lord and his human instrumentation. In other words, to break it down into Genesee and Southwest uh, Rochester vernacular, we couldn't have worked wake ourselves up this morning took the Lord to wake us up. We didn't have the capacity to put one foot in front of the other, but it took the Lord to allow our brain and our nervous system and our muscles to work together so that one foot could get in front of the other and we could keep our balance. Uh, you could not write one paycheck to yourself, but it was God that worked on somebody's life uh, and somebody's mind to give you a job and an opportunity so that you could take care of yourself and your family. 
I know that you think you opened doors yourself, that you defeated your own enemies, but I want to give you a stark reality today that you didn't do anything on your own. I wish y'all helped me because I came to preach this morning, but it was the Lord working on your side that made everything possible in your life. It was the psalmist that said, if it was not for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Uh, every now and then we need to embrace the reality of that text that the Lord did everything. He put your cornflakes on the table this morning. He helped you pay your RG&E bill. He regulated your mind when you had confusion everywhere in your life. He made your enemies your footstool. He kept you up when the pressure of life was trying to knock you down. It was the Lord that did everything for you. I know we have these human uh, predispositions to pat ourselves on the back, to hold our head up and elevate our nose and think that we did all of these things for ourselves. But it was not us doing things for ourselves, but it was the Lord working on our behalf. I wish I had some help in here. As a matter of fact, if you don't mind, just nudge your neighbor. Say, neighbor, the Lord did it for you. Uh, yeah, he did it for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you think you look good, but the Lord put that smile on your face. Can I just preach it like I feel it? I know you think that you're something because you drove a Cadillac, a Lincoln, or a Beamer to church, but the Lord gave you the Cadillac and the Beamer, and he even put the gasoline in it for you. I know you think you look good, but the Lord gave you that money to buy that MAC cosmetics to put on your face to cover up your blemishes. He, he, gave, you the, he gave you the capacity to go and buy your platinum hair weave and everything else. It, it was the Lord that helped you to be able to buy those dentures and everything so that you can smile in everybody's face this morning. Don't think you did anything on your own. It was the Lord. Can I just tell you what I feel? I get tired of arrogant Christians that walk into church and act like they're the best thing that ever happened to the Lord. It was the Lord that did everything. You ought to be humble. Strutting in the Lord's house. Like it's a favor because you are here. It was the Lord that shook you this morning and woke you up. That didn't let you die in the middle of the night, but he kept you. And you gonna talk about what you can do on your own. The Lord works in our lives and we cannot work without him and his human instrumentation. Thus, in essence, for us to be able to do most things in our lives and the things the Lord, uh, things of the Lord, we must employ our relationship with him and those whom he has assigned to our lives to be used for his glorious purpose. Thus, not only do I need the Lord, but I need some folks in my life that have been touched by the Lord to be a blessing to me, to prop me up on every leaning side so you cannot have that isolationist mentality to think that you can make it all by yourself but what the Lord doesn't do in your life he will assign someone else to come along beside you that's why you ought not have an attitude to anyone you ought to thank God for everyone in the house of the Lord because you don't know who the Lord has sent in here to feed you when you're hungry to watch over your children to give you a blessing when you need a blessing to give you a hug and embrace and tell you everything is going to be all right. That's why I don't look crazy at anybody in church because I believe that everyone in here is a, has a capacity to be a blessing to me. Thus, we must be cautious about determining our destiny based upon what we see from our human perspective, what we feel we have the resources to do, and what others declare as our ability. When we are considering the divine designs for our lives, we must include the paradigm of what shall, what shall be when the Lord places his influence into our circumstance, whether directly by his presence or indirectly by human instrumentation. Every now and then, I just have to look in the mirror and say, thank you, Lord, because when I look at the incredible journey he's allowed me to come upon, I didn't think that I would achieve some things that I've been blessed to achieve. I didn't think that I would have some opportunities that the Lord gave me, but every now and then, I just have to pitch myself and say, Lord, I thank you for being so good in my life. I could have dreamed in my wildest dreams, Lord, that you would be this good to me, that you would allow me to prosper like you, allow me to prosper, that you would 
God opened doors for me. And thus when I come into his house, I have a whole different attitude because I place it in context, my existential experience, that the Lord has been better to me than what I deserve. Thus when I come into the house of the Lord, I'm like the psalmist when he said, I, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I don't have time to worry about what someone has on. I don't have time to worry about who did what in worship. I don't have time to worry about who likes me and who don't like me. I don't have time to worry about what I'm not the president of. I don't have time to worry about what I didn't get to do this week because I come to the house of the Lord because he's been good to me. Yeah. yeah. Thus, as we endeavor to identify and receive the Lord's revelation for our lives, we must have the audacity to believe that when we reach our limitations, that's not the end of his revelation or vision for our lives. Rather, it is merely another realm we enter into that is dependent upon his divine activity. So in other words, when Jonathan runs out, my vision and my revelation for life does not run out because I know that when my human strength runs out, that the Lord is going to already be right there waiting for me and where I cannot take myself. He's already made a way to take me to where he wants me to be. I wish I had somebody in here that somebody looked at your life and said you would never be anything. But what they did not know is that when you reached the end of your strength and your might, they did not know that the Lord was standing right there ready to pick you up and carry you further. I wish I had someone here that folks looked at your life and said you came from the wrong side of of the tracks, but what they did not know is that your heavenly father owned the tracks, and he can take you wherever he wants you to go. I wish I had somebody in here that said you would never be worth a nickel or a dime, but they did not know the plans that God has for your life. Is there anybody in here that can say, I'm an ex-somebody, I'm an overcomer, take a good look at me now, because I have not seen or ears heard what the Lord's going to do in my learned a long time ago not to put limitations on God because he can and will do anything yes he will thus as we endeavor to identify and receive the Lord's revelation for our lives we have to believe that he will take us further thus we must develop the faith capacity to see attempt and believe beyond the scope of our might and our limited vision. In other words, our vision for life and our vision for the church ought to reach a place that goes beyond what we can do. The vision ought to be something that we cannot afford because we're trusting that God is going to be the source of our supply. I wish I had some help in here. The vision for your life ought to sound ridiculous to your friends because they don't know what God's plan is for your life. I wish I I had some help in here. I can't get my testimony. I remember when I went to my first church in January of 1996 in a place called Bandana, Kentucky with nine members and the youngest member was 76 years old and I told one of my friends, I said, you know what? I had a vision that one of these days I'm going to be a full-time pastor. I was making $50 a week for the first year of pastoring as a pastor and I said, I believe the Lord's going to take me somewhere. The Lord showed me I'm going to pastor a big church where I can drive a nice car and live in a nice home and I'm going to have a whole lot of folks to teach Bible study to. I said, I have a vision that I'm going to have over a hundred folks to teach Bible study to. And you know what? That Negro laughed at me. But you know what? They're not laughing now. They're looking on YouTube to see what I'm doing. Don't tell me what God will not do. Yeah. Yeah. Touch somebody and say, don't laugh at my vision. Because God is about to do it. God's taking me somewhere. letting folks limit what your revelation is or what God told you. Stop allowing folks to limit what God is going to do in your life. You better stop believing big because you serve a big God. We must believe the Lord is willing and perhaps already in the process of working some things out that we have not even comprehended or faced yet on our journey. I firmly believe that in route to getting to where the Lord wants us to be, he has already declared healing on some things that are yet to afflict our bodies. Mm. 
Let, let me say that one more time. He's already declared a healing on some things that are yet to affect our bodies. Yeah, yeah, that means some of y'all don't need to worry about some sicknesses and illnesses because the Lord already saw in his foreknowledge what was coming your way and he already set a date for your healing and your deliverance. I believe that all the Lord has already defeated my enemies whom I've yet to even meet or encounter. That means I might have some enemies that rise up in 2023. I don't even know them yet, but I believe in faith that God has already handled my battles and my fights before I even get there because the theology of the text tells me so. He's already given us the victory in some battles that we have yet to engage. He's already deposited some wealth into our life that still has to reach our hand or our bank accounts. Some of y'all look at me like a deer in headlights, but I'm trying to get you to understand that if God says he is for you, then God is for you. Stop worrying about how things look. Stop worrying about what folks say about you. Stop worrying about your current pain and your current stress. If God said he will make a way for you out of no way. It doesn't matter how bad things get. It's already done. Somebody ought to shout, it's already done. I'm driving a hoop day, but it's already done. I'm living in the projects, but it's already done. I still have aches and pains in my body, but it's already done. I'm despised and I'm talked about, but it's already done. Folks are lying on me, but it's already done. Folks are digging ditches for you, but it's already you see it, but you got to understand that the Lord has already worked it out. High five your neighbor and say, he's already worked it out. Thus, if we employ this paradigm of faith to our lives, we will have, watch this, an irrevocable confidence in the Lord that will lead us to claim our new territory. Irrevocable confidence. That means that our confidence in the Lord cannot be shattered or eradicated based upon conditions in life. It doesn't matter what I face or how bad the storms may get. I'm not going to cast away my confidence in the Lord. I can get down to my last dollar, but I still will believe that I shall not want because he is my shepherd. I wish I had some help in here. I'm preaching a testimony because there's been times when I got down to my last dollar, but the Lord still made a way. I wish I had somebody in here. Ah, uh, yeah, you got to believe that it's already done, and no matter what you go through in route to your destiny, you shall have the victory in your life, because you have an irrevocable confidence that the Lord is not going to leave you nor forsake you. You sit here losing your mind about stuff the Lord has already worked out in your life. And worrying about how you're going to pay your bills. And he done already told you the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not walk. you worried about some nigga that walked off and left you. And he said, who can be against y'all? Y'all better help me up in here. I know why some of y'all cry and shout in church. Irrevocable confidence. No matter what comes in my life. I know the Lord is still going to be with me. The old Baptist church used to say it like this. They said, be not dismayed. Whatever be time, God will. I wish I had somebody in here. Y'all, 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 y'all pseudo Baptists in here. Amen. I got to find some real Baptists. Thus we find at this historical juncture of the text, the Lord is attempting to impart this type of faith and paradigm to the Hebrew nation. He wants them to comprehend the Lord's plan was not simply to get them out of Egypt, but it was inclusive of taking them into a land of promise. Furthermore, he wants them to understand that in spite of their limitations and obstacles, the Lord is going to perform whatever is needed to get them where 
where he desires them to be. Watch this. He's going to perform whatever is needed to get them from a place of bondage to a place of promise. He's going to perform whatever is needed to take them out of their place of oppression and move them to a place of celebration. So why are you worrying about your giants, worrying about your Jordan rivers, worrying about your adversaries, your foes, and your limitations? All you've got to do is trust the Lord and move when he tells you to move. And the Lord has already declared theologically that he's already made a way for you to get to where he wants you to be. Is there anybody in here today that believes the Lord is taking you somewhere? Oh, I wish I had some help in here. Poverty is not your home. Depression is not your home. Oppression is not your home. Rebuked and sworn is not your home. Sickness is not your home. But the Lord is taking you somewhere. Mm -hmm. Thus he plainly tells them in essence, regardless of what or whom you may face, the text says that no man can stand against you. Is that in your Bible? Come on, Carrie, we're getting ready to get out of here in just about 60 seconds. No man can stand against you. Thus the key to victory was not in the Lord because he had already done and declared what he had done. Yeah. The key to victory was simply believing the Lord at his word. Yeah. In other words, they simply had to have the courage and faith in spite of who or what they face. And I believe this is the commentary of us in the kingdom today. The Lord has already done all that he needs to do to secure our victory in all things. It is now just a matter of us qualifying ourselves and believing what he has already done. We must learn to incorporate the words and actions of the theologian Paul Tillich into our lives. Tillich wrote a book entitled The Courage to Be. In his writing, he answers the existential angst that plagues our faith through human anxiety. Essentially, Tillich asserts that in spite of our human and faith anxieties which we face, we must have the courage to be and I declare that that is a word for someone today. I know things look mighty bad in your situation. However, in spite of how things look or who stands against you or what you might be hearing, you have to have the courage to be. I am who the Lord says I am. I will have what the Lord says I shall have. I will overcome anything in my path. I am the head the tail. I am more than a conqueror. I am blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field. I am like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. I am being followed by grace and mercy. I don't care how things look in life. I don't care what people might say about me. I declare that I have the courage to be. Do I have anybody in here that has the courage to be this morning. It doesn't matter how things may be in your life right now, but you have to have the courage to be. You got to look in the mirror and tell yourself that I am blessed and highly favored. You got to look in the mirror and tell yourself. You got to say, self, you're the baddest person I know. You got to tell somebody that I shall become everything that the Lord wants me to become. I'm not going to get to my three points because I feel my help right here. The Lord wants somebody in here to understand that oppression is not your name. That depression is not your name. That oppressed is not where you're going to always be. Because the Lord said that no man shall be able to stand before you. And as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I don't know about you, but that's all I need to know. Because no matter what I face, I'm going to trust in the Lord. And I'm going to know that the victory is already mine. Is there anybody in here that's not going to turn around? You're not going back to Egypt. You're not going to stay in the wilderness, but you're going to press your way into your place of promise, and you believe that the Lord has something.
something for you. Is there anybody in here that believes the Lord has something for you? Do you believe that the best is yet to come? Do you believe that your struggle is only temporary? Do you believe that your sickness shall come to pass? Do you believe that your bondage shall be broken? Well, if you believe it, you ought to celebrate right now because you know that the Lord has already made a way because when you look at the literary context, you wanted an educated preacher. Here it is right here. When you look at the literary context of the theology, when the Lord makes this statement, he's not really giving in the present time, but he's speaking in past tense. He's saying that no man shall be able to stand before you. He's speaking from the perspective that he as God, as our divine creator, that he ran ahead of us in life through his providential care, that he saw in the forecast what was coming our way before it even got to our doorstep. And he said, I went ahead of you, and I already worked things out. I healed you of your sickness. I fixed your husband and your wife. I watched over your children. I paid your bills. I made your enemies your footstool. It's already handled. All you got to do is just keep on marching forward because no man shall be able to stand against you because I already brought the strongholds down. I already brought the walls down. I already gave you the victory. I wish I had about a hundred folks in here that can know that I can act like they already have the victory, that know that the Lord has already worked it out. You're not worried about tomorrow because you know who holds your hand. You're not worried about what you shall face because you know the Lord has already handled it. Is there anybody in here that knows that they are a part of the Joshua generation? The Lord has already claimed your territory. He's already killed your giants. He's already brought down the walls on your behalf. And all you got to do is walk and trust in the Lord. And walking ought to be easy because he says in the text that I shall not leave you and I shall not forsake you. That means when everybody else walks out on you, the Lord is still going to be there. That's why I don't worry about who is happy and who is mad. I don't worry about who walks with me and who walks away from me. I don't care about friends, enemies, or haters because as long as I have the Lord on my side, I know that he will work out everything in my life. Is there anybody in here that can give the Lord a good advertisement that say, I'm still here because he walks with me. I'm still here because he talks with me. I'm still here because he tells me I am his own. Is there anybody in here that is a product of the presence of the Lord? Because had he not walked with me, I would have lost my mind. Had he not walked with me, I would have died a long time ago. Had he not walked with me, I would have been defeated. But I have a praise in my mouth because the Lord years. I have a praise in my mouth because he has not forsaken me yet. I've seen some folks come and go. I've seen some folks turn and change, but the Lord never changes. If the Lord is with you, then the Lord is with you. Come here, Jesus. Jesus can give me a good testimony that no one can be against us. Jesus can say, I came into this world as the Son of God. I was born in a man Society looked down at me. I had to be raised in the lowest social economic land. I was a carpenter's boy. I tried to go to the temple and give them a word from the Lord, and they threw me out of the temple. I tried to heal the sick. I made the lame to walk. I made the blind to see. I cured those that had disease. And where did it get me? It got me on the cross where I had nails in my hands. I I had a crown of thorns on my head. Talk to us, Jesus. They pierced me in my side. And my captain sat there and said, if you are the son of God, you ought to come off of that cross. But Jesus could say, I kept on trusting in him. Because I said, Father, not my will, but thine will be done. He could say, Father, I cast my soul into your hands. And they placed him in a bottle of tomb. And even 
some of them that walked closely with them went back to their old way of life. But Jesus kept on trusting. And the Bible says that early one Sunday morning, my midnight rise. Early one Sunday morning, my lily of the vows. I was in the Baptist church. Early one Sunday morning, my rose of Sharon got up from the grave and said, I have a 